action game on. Got my rods and reels. It's the real deal. <laughs> When I found out I was going back to Panama to fish with Sebago Bay Sport Fishing again, my excitement level peaked. Panama borders Colombia to the north and Costa Rica to the south. It is easily the most modern country in Central America. In fact, Panama City is also the most prosperous, due in part to the multicultural society and the commerce that goes through the Panama Canal. I've personally spent 12 years in and out of Panama as a fisheries biologist for Scripps Institute of Oceanography, working on commercial tuna boats. Although I love the culture, the people, and the country itself, it's absolutely the fishing which tops my list of favorite places to target for the multitude of species that are found there. Mel, my favorite taxi driver in the city, tells me that it's carnival time in February and that we might hit some traffic on the way to the boat. But you know what? I'm kind of looking forward to seeing all those festivities. We've driven several hours now and we've seen bits and pieces of it. We just found ourselves literally in the middle of the biggest carnival celebration we've found on the entire trip. <laughs> After crawling through the streets of San Diego with carnival in full swing, we finally get to Porta Mude and meet the boys and part with Mel. Had the twin engine uh, Ponga, we loaded it, ran out for an hour and a half to get into Sebago Bay. We know we're close when Sombrero Rock comes into view, and just around the corner is Sebago Bay. Seeing the Sebago Bay mothership anchored in this unbelievable spot, surrounded by lush jungle and stunning sandy beaches, you think to yourself, wow, I'm gonna be here for the next few days? Then you pull up to the boat and you're enthusiastically welcomed by the boys. It's like you never left. Yeah, man, what's up? Welcome back. Hey, hey, Jim Weiss, what is up, buddy? I'm really excited to see my longtime friend, Jimmy Weiss, the owner of Sebaco Bay. This guy is a crazed businessman in Panama and we never get to fish together anymore. So when he invited us down for the trip, I insisted that he take some time to enjoy his investment. How's fishing? How's fishing? I don't know. Let's see. I just got here too. I think it's good. Perfect. Pleasure for me, my friend, is to be able to fish with you this week. Give me the rundown. I want to head towards Hannibal. Okay. And to go to Hannibal, let's take the Agua. Let's oh, really? Let's go. Okay. We'll be over there for three or four days. Three or four days? Yeah, we'll go over Oh, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, we're going to camp out. No way on the, on the Agua. What time do you want to take off? What time are you gonna get up? Hey man, I'll get up whenever you want to go. Are you kidding me? I've been Jones for this trip. I'm up early. Well, let's get a good night's sleep. We'll rock and roll tomorrow morning. Sounds like a plan. All right, man. Let's do it. Awesome being back. Awesome being back. Good having you back, bro. <laughs> Seriously, I could hardly sleep that night thinking about what was gonna happen the next three days. You know, every time I come to Sevago Bay, I expect to catch fish. And to me, I don't care if I'm popper fishing, if I'm jig fishing, or if I'm trolling for marlin or tunas. To me, it's just getting out there in this beautiful, pristine, pelagic environment and sampling some fish. We're going out with Adial, who's the captain who I've always fished with down here, the best mate on the Sebago Bay, which is Elias, then the chief engineer here on the Sebago Bay, which is Guillermo. We had Jacqueline, who is Jim Weiss's beautiful wife, and her good friend, Nilsa. Jim actually pre-fished for two days, and as he put it in perfect words, he found out where the fish weren't which is a good thing for us, because after two days of fishing where they're not, you bet you get really good chance of trying to find them in other places. And that was about a 30 mile run out to Cueva Island, fishing the world famous Hannibal Bank. The water started to just clear up a little bit when we got there. Went around a corner, pulled up to a secret little high spot that we have, and we jigged up what we call here in Panama, Cherna. That's it, my friend. You just stop on a, on a high spot and you're bendo as soon as you get them down. Good job, Adi. Whoa, broomtail grouper! Broomtail grouper! Okay, you guys, yeah, you know what we want to do? We're going to put this up for contention for an IGFA length record. Broomtail grouper, very common species here in Panama as throughout anywhere else in the Eastern Shelf Pacific Ocean. 
I'm telling you, they're not a real common grouper. This is a big one. This is a good fish. I think because this record class is so new, we may have a world record here. Net. Okay, boys. Very cool. Let's get a measurement. That's it. There we go. Get the chin up to that. We're looking at, to the bottom here, about 103 centimeters. Right there, beautiful fish. Broomtail grouper, they name it the broomtail because of the shape of that tail. It's like a broom. Beautiful fish, unbelievable. I'm not sure it's a world record, but we're gonna find out soon enough. I guarantee we wanna get this fish back in the water. Wow, what a gorgeous animal. Our first fish of the trip, probably 15 minutes in the water, was an IGFA length record potential, a wow. broomtail grouper. Nice. So, it's vacant. We've got the gag grouper and the red grouper. No broomtail. So guess what? New world record. That's Somebody great. else is going to have to beat that one. Woo! First fish of the trip! A length record for all of y'all! Woo! Fox rods and the Halco jig. Right on. Getting us in the book early in the trip. And I'm thinking to myself, what a great omen to start this trip with, you know? An unexpected fish, something you wouldn't typically target here. But we were all a little bit anxious to get going, head to Hannibal, and see if we could find ourselves a marlin. And uh, kind of a, a sore sight for a sport fisherman was to come back on the Hannibal Bank and see, I believe there were like six uh, local commercial boats. They were bottom fishing. Some of them had flags where you know they're gonna long line right on top of that bank. And then we caught some amberjacks. These fish they call the Peruvian amberjack. A species I've never seen in my life. And uh, it was kind of funny to, you know, to, to show the local boys that a metal jig can hook a fish every bit as good as their dead bait. I'm just as excited to see where we're gonna camp that night. Because to me, that's a real unique Panamanian experience. Come out here and anchor up a, a beautiful boat like uh, the Aguja in some remote anchorage on Cueva Island. So when we came in, we dropped the bow anchor, come back, drop a stern, bingo, bow string the boat, and I'm looking around my surroundings, and not only what I was seeing was just absolutely amazing jungle environment, what I was smelling. You literally can smell the jungle. It really grabs your senses. And to me, that's when I realized this is gonna be a really, really unique adventure. Got up the next day, a cup of coffee, a little fresh fruit, a little breakfast, and we headed back to the Hannibal Bank, hoping the conditions had changed. And guess what? They had. The water had gotten cleaner, things looked a little fishier. So we gave it about two hours. Slow trolling big baits for those marlin, didn't find one. So Jimmy says, you know what? I think if we go out to Montosa, which I believe he says about another 12 miles, you can see it there off in the distance. That's one thing that's beautiful about this place here, Sebaco Bay and Northwestern Panama. Is you've got options, lots and lots of options. Come around that west side, and there's just breezers, breezers of tunas, porpoise, yellowfin jumping. I'm thinking, you know what? We just found utopia. The boy started casting into the boils. Whoa! Bit right there. We're thinking we got some beautiful school of yellowfin. Mm -hmm. And they were Jack Cravel. Now, I haven't seen this too many times. What seems to be when you're around the island environments, the porpoise are pushing bait close to the island. Those Jack Cravel, which are typically a reef species, will come out and get in those porpoise and feed with them. So we caught a couple of really nice Jack Cravels. And I got to say, I think I kind of blew it. Because we're seeing 100 pound tuna crashing on the porpoise about a half mile away. And I'm sitting there messing around on light tackle on a Jack Cravel. And it took me about 15 minutes to finally oh, no. get that thing in the boat. And when we finally got in the boat and released it, the porpoise and tuna had died out. I hate to say it, but I could have strangled them. So we had some bonita in the tubes, tossed them out, slow trolled them two and a half knots, and then you, know, you have a hard knockdown. The, it's bailing like, I, I think we had an 80 out, and it's, it's stripping it. But I saw it coming, and it was one of these big, black dolphins. This went back and forth for 15 minutes before we were able to get that bait, what was left of it, ahead back to the boat. That nixed the idea of trolling for, you know, fishing marlin there. 
Jimmy says, you know what, let's go out and try to find some of that blue water. Get away from the island a little bit. Got out to about six, 700 feet of water, right around that 100 fathom curve. Put out a marlin spread, and about 30 minutes later, cop, pow, blue marlin comes in short, comes off the teaser immediately, hits the uh, flat line, spins out about 50 yards of line, just smoking us back to the stern, never jumped, just ate it, ran, and spit it. And it's depressing when this is happening, you know? We're, we're all getting a little bit bummed out. Good. Started doing more rounds, the day's wearing on. We all decided it's another day, we've got to go head back to the anchorage, it's getting a little late. They, there just wasn't anything out there. So we leave Montosa, we're coming back over to the anchorage, we thought, well, hey, we're gonna be going over the Hannibal Bank, let's give it another shot. Even if it's not for Marlin, maybe we'll do some deep jigging. Maybe we'll get a, a nice uh, Almaco Jack, maybe a dog tooth snapper. Who knows, maybe another broomtail grouper. Fish one! Ay -ya! All right. Gotta be nice to get a snapper or something out of here. Something to take home for dinner. Nice way to end the day. Whoa, that this thing is pretty interesting to fight. Real heavy head shakes, tail shakes. Runs. Whoa. Give this fox a workout. Oh. Now this is an amberjack. This is an albaco jack. Uh, so we kind of uh, cut the uh, amberjack, and I've always released them. I, you know, because the amberjack you catch in the Atlantic are kind of an oily, kind of a little bit of a dark meated fish. But the albaco jacks here in the Pacific are a very light meated fish, and I guess really, really excellent table fare. The locals love them. So uh, Jimmy says, hey, tell you what, if you'd like to try this Almaco Jack, we're going to keep it, and we'll bring it in and have it for dinner. So I was kind of excited about that. Jimmy says, we're losing light. Let's get in. By the time we anchor up, get the boys to cook this fish up, it's definitely going to be supper time and time to get some sleep. Whole day itself, I mean, look at what we did. We actually raised a sailfish on the Hannibal Bank. It went off to Montoso. We got bit by a blue marlin, caught those jackavels, came in, caught the, caught the Almaco Jack. So catching fish, absolutely we caught fish. Had a great day, absolutely had a great day. Flat, calm waters like fish in the Sea of Cortez. But was it the marlin and tuna action we were hoping for? No. But the good news was the conditions were definitely getting better. And to me, third day is the charm. I was looking forward to that third day. I gotta tell you. Just the experience of being on a 56 Viking in some remote anchorage on Koiba Island was experience enough for me that was well, well worth the trip. But the third day we go back out, and guess what? The water had cleaned up considerably again to another level on the Hannibal Banks. Let's go find some of the high spots that produce some pretty good bottom fish. A couple of boats there that I know that I fish with that are good, they were there. So we gave it a good shot. We fished that for about two hours in conditions I thought were pretty prime. So we grabbed our baits and we rigged them up and we started pulling them. And then we saw one of the boats adjacent to us get jumped on by the porpoise. They ravaged his baits. And I told my boys, I said, it's a matter of just minutes, if not seconds, before <laughs> all of a sudden, before I can get it out of my mouth, man. <sighs> the porpoise are on it. And in the process of being robbed by these things, the downrigger went off, and we just thought it was another porpoise. So RL's cranking it on up, you know. Whoa. He's not finessing it at all because he figures he's got a porpoise on the other end. And this Pretty good sized amberjack, I'd call it 30, 40 pounds. Whoa. Comes up and everybody gets all excited because wow, look at that. You know, we thought it was a porpoise and it's just nice fish, you know. I, these things get big. This is a decent fish. Whoa, nice. And we're thinking to ourselves, wow, three days, we've caught a lot of fish, but not the money fish. Not the fish that people want to come down here and fish. And lo and behold, like off on the horizon, we see a commercial boat out there trolling with a big long mast, a single mast, and a huge splash. And there's only one boat in the world that makes that commotion, and that's what they call this green stick boat. And when those guys are out there, the tuna are there. I mean, that's why they're there. I told Bill, I said, Bill, let's go get by the boat. We'll shadow this guy for a while, and if there's a tuna to be caught, we'll catch it. 
Jim and I look at each other going, my God, this guy's in the middle of the best action. We're not leaving this guy. In fact, we're gonna fish right beside him. We just put out our spread, and I don't think it was 10 minutes before we were hooked up. Kapow! What goes off? The smallest rod in the arsenal, 30 pound test, and I'm up to do battle with the fish. We are bit. Hey, Bill. Yep. Has it got any size to it? Ah, it doesn't feel real big, but hey, a tuna's a tuna right now. Well, about 10 minutes into the fight, this thing's still peeling line. Hey, Jimmy, might be a little bigger than we thought. Jim looks down at the sounder and sees a big red ball of fish. I said, you know, a technique I've used in the past is putting chrome jigs down into those schools. So out of y'all, picked up that Fox spinner and threw out one of those four and a half ounce Halco chrome jig with a dangle hook, and my fish comes across and hits his line. Uh-oh. Get that thing out of the water, please. Oh, Jesus. Oh, boy. Get it out of it. It's on it. When I've got that much tension on 30-pound mono, that deep, any kind of tension is going to cut my line. Just cut it. Elias, very, very attentive. He ran over, grabbed the line, cut it, and then we were good to go. Because once that line slack, it's not an issue. Finally get it up to color after about an hour on 30, we look down and realize this is definitely over 100, not 150, but it's a good yellowfin tuna. And I'm giving this thing all the pressure I can. You know, the sun was shining still. It's hot. It was a very windless day. And that fish and him were just going at it like arm wrestling or something, you know? It was like, who's gonna win? And in the end, I, I wasn't sure if he was gonna be able to take it. I was, I was worried about it. Grab leader, grab leader, grab leader! Grab leader! That twister jig and all that tough line braid was still wrapped up in my line. You can get a knife and cut as much of that line, because if that line gets caught in the prop, we're screwed. We fished for three days to hook that fish, I wasn't losing it. That bimini went through those guides, through the guides, through the guides. We had that fish 30, 40 feet below us. Literally almost three hours into the fight, we finally got it up, got past the jig, wound it up, and stuck it with a gaff. Oh, yeah, baby! I don't know who's more excited about that fish coming over the rail, me or Jim. He came down that ladder so fast, gave me a big hug, high five. He was just stoked. We worked three days for a real proper Panama fish, and it's in the boat. But more importantly than that, we knew we were gonna go back to our campground on Goiba, drop the pick, and have a beautiful plate of well-deserved sashimi. I spent 12 years working for the Tropical Tuna Commission, and about eight of those years, I spent lots of time in and out of Panama, because the American tuna boats at that point were unloading their catch over in Puerto Rico, and they would come through the Panama Canal and then go to the Eastern Pacific Ocean to fish. So the government would fly me to Panama, wait for the boats to come in, pick me up, and I'd go. And then after a 60, 70, 80 day trip at sea, I'd come back to Panama and I'd fly home from Panama. So three or four times a year, I was in and out of Panama. I saw a lot of changes in the city, but the canal itself is just absolutely amazing. And to be able to be tied up and see the commerce going by every day, talk to guys working on the dock, how much pride there is in Panama amongst Panamanians that this is in their country and exists is really, really heartwarming. What you've got here, these are electric mules, they call them. They literally take wire and they strap it to the boat and they bowstring the boat between the two locks. This boat is not motoring through the canal, it's being pulled through the canal. It was began actually in the uh, early 1900s by the French. The Americans took over the project and finished it in 1913. There's actually two lanes on both the north and south side that allow for more traffic to go through. Which is really interesting, the locks are 110 feet wide. Most of your large ships, including a lot of our battleships from World War II, uh, the Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth II, all those ships were 108 feet wide. And the reason being is so that all those ships could literally make it through this canal with one foot of clearance on both sides. That's why it's so important for the electric mules to bowstring these boats in between this so it doesn't rub its way through the canal. When you come in from the Pacific side or you come in from the Atlantic side, a pilot will enter your boat 
and he'll help you navigate into the, into the locks. And from then on, you toss a few lines, they string you up, and you just sit back and watch the show. I've actually been through the canal twice. It's an amazing experience. And I've actually fished the canal, Lake Catun, several times for peacock bass. If there's a lot of small ships, they'll group you together, and then you just go along as a group. You might have a tuna boat, a couple of big yachts, a couple of sailboats, and they'll all come through at the same time. It, it really is an engineering marvel. Every time I come here, I'm just amazed that this was done back in the early 1900s, and it's still fully functional today. You know, the last four days have been nothing short of miraculous. They always are here at Sebaco Bay. The quality of the fishing, the quality of the experience says it all. I wish to thank Jim and Jackie Weiss for all the hospitality they threw down this week to make this trip possible, and the professionalism of the crew, from the cooking, to the mating, to, to everything they do to make your Sebaco Bay experience one of quality. I can't thank you guys enough. You know, I was fortunate enough to be here this week. The only thing missing was you. Ha, ha, ha.